no better place to do an ethics case study than the Las Vegas Strip, and no better subject than physicist George Gamow, who's described as a card trick playing, booze swilling, limerick singing, giant imp of a prankster, whose idea of a balanced breakfast was two dry martinis. He seems like a pretty rad dude, but this is an ethics case study, so you know he messed up something. So this case study is going to be about the Alpha Beta Gamma paper, which was titled The Origin of Chemical Elements, which is one of the first big advances that led to the Big Bang Theory being adopted as the accepted theory of the origin of the universe. So first we'll introduce the two main players, Professor George Gamow and student Ralph Alpher. We'll talk about the contents of their paper and the ethical violation. Then I'm gonna wrap it up with discussion about how this ethical violation actually occurs all the time in workplaces today so that you'll be able to look out for it in advance and avoid making it yourself. So George Gamow was a Soviet physicist who rose to prominence in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, working with scientists you may have heard of like Niels Bohr. He started off doing work on atoms and then later got into cosmology. It was in the Soviet Union that he met his wife, who he nicknamed Ro. Foreshadowing. And who I will call Ro because it will certainly help me avoid this mispronunciation. And if you want to learn more about Ro, check out this book based on her true life story. It's a story of romance, political intrigue, and the search for priceless Russian treasure. And if anybody out there does read this book, leave me a comment. Let me know if it's any good. So one thing the Soviet Union is infamous for is secrecy. Basically, they didn't want their scientific and technical advances being distributed to the West. And if you know anything about Chernobyl, you'll know that Soviet secrecy was one of the leading causes of that disaster. Why? worry about something that isn't going to happen oh that's perfect they should put that on our money the direct impact to george gamov was that the soviets would not let him leave the country to go to international conferences to work with his peers directly and over time he became increasingly frustrated by this and he wanted to defect gamov and his wife ro even attempted to defect by kayaking over the black sea to turkey and over the north sea to norway but both times had to turn back due to weather kayaking over the open ocean. This guy wanted out. But eventually, after years, the Soviets finally gave him a passport in the 1930s to attend an international conference, and he insisted that his wife be allowed to come with him, and they never went back to the Soviet Union. And another famous scientist, Marie Curie, was instrumental in finding him housing and helping him get away. So by 1940, George Gamow has become a naturalized citizen in the United States working at George Washington University where he lives with his wife, Ro. So he's already a worldwide prestige scientist, worked with Niels Bohr, worked with Marie Curie, and it was at George Washington that he met his student, a math prodigy by the name of Ralph Alpher. <laughs> So I'll misquote Ralph Alpher as having said, there are two reasons to enter science as a career. One is to advance mankind, and the second is to seek approbation of your peers. And unfortunately, the second reason was a constant sore spot throughout his career. So Ralph Alpher was combat aged during World War II, but instead of being deployed to combat, he was actually sent to work in the research labs, where he worked on the magnetic detonators for torpedoes, also worked to develop techniques to find submarines magnetically, right? They're big metal objects underwater. Maybe you can find them with magnets. And it looks like he was also part of the Manhattan Project, which was, of course, the top secret project that led to the atomic bomb. So for someone who prioritized seeking approval of their peers, all this work on top secret material may have been a little bit frustrating at the time because you can't tell anybody about it. After the war, Ralph Alpher became a student of George Gamow at George Washington University. And together they created the paper, The Origin of Chemical Elements. So in 1948, the Big Bang Theory was not accepted. There were many theories for the origin of the universe. Alpher and Gamow proposed that initially all protons and neutrons in the universe were individually scattered. And then immediately after the Big Bang, they started colliding and sometimes they would stick. A proton by itself is a hydrogen atom. A proton plus a neutron make a deuterium atom. Add another neutron, you get tritium. Or combine two deuterium atoms and you get a helium atom. And so on. After, right after the Big Bang, everything starts colliding together and sticks and supposedly all of these individual collisions, one after the other, they would all add up to create all of the heavier elements. And in this paper, what they calculated was exactly what percentage of each element we should see in the universe if this theory were true. 
And the percentages that they calculate basically are what we do see in this universe. A huge amount of hydrogen, a medium amount of helium, and very small trace amounts of basically every other element. Now it should be noted that their idea is only partially correct. In 2022, this is how we believe hydrogen and helium were created in the Big Bang. But there were some holes in this theory, and we do think that all of the heavier elements were actually created within stars and then spread throughout the galaxy in supernova explosions. So the workload went something like this. George Gamow came up with the differential equations that modeled this theory of neutrons and protons sticking together, but couldn't solve them himself. Instead, he assigned that to his grad student, like all professors would do. And it was then Ralph Alpher who numerically integrated these differential equations, which means he basically did all of the work which is properly insane by today's standards. Numerical integration of differential equations is extremely difficult, and we do that by computers nowadays. To do that by hand back in 1948 is an amazing feat. 1.74 h-bar, okay? The uncertainty principle. It proves we can't ever really know what's going on. So George Gamow came up with the idea, Ralph Alpher did all the work, they wrote their paper, The Origin of Chemical Elements, with two authors, Alpher and Gamow. And here's the ethics violation. Gamow, as a complete practical joke because he loves the Greek alphabet, remember? Gamow added a friend of his, Hans Betha, Beta, to the paper so that by the time it went to submission to Physical Review, it now had three authors on it, Alpha, Beta, and Gamma, which is why it's now known as the Alpha, Beta, Gamma paper. Beta did absolutely none of the work, didn't even know the paper existed, but was listed as a co-author. And in scientific fields, co-authorship is a big deal. Who gets credit for the work? This is not something you joke about. But Beta, he actually found the joke hilarious. Originally when the paper was submitted, it had Hans Beta in absentia written after it, meaning that he wasn't actually there doing the work with the other two authors. But when the editor showed him the paper, he loved the article and loved the joke, and he told the editors to remove in absentia from his name so that he would be listed on par with both of the other authors. In the aftermath, the paper got a ton of attention, was widely accepted, and really rose the Big Bang Theory up to prominence. Even though Beta wasn't involved in this paper, Beta actually did work on the follow-on research which showed that the second half, the heavier elements part that didn't work in this proposal, he actually showed how those elements were formed within stars. So at least he sort of redeemed himself by being kind of involved in the field and still advancing the theory later on. A PhD dissertation is normally a very small affair with about three committee members and maybe a few friends or family watching where a student presents the results of their research and then gets hopefully approval from the committee members and they earn their PhD. For Ralph Alpher's PhD, he had over 300 attendees, including journalists in the news media, who came to, to learn from him because that's how big this paper had become. Nonetheless, for the rest of his career, Alpher still insisted that he did not receive the acclaim that he should have gotten for this paper. And in fact, the two much more famous scientists, Gamov and Betha, they actually got more of the credit from within the scientific community, even though his name was on the paper as the first author, the one who did the most work. All right, so let's talk the ethics. Why is this a problem? What should have happened? So this is essentially an abuse of authority by Gamov. These sorts of professional jokes are only funny to peers. They are never funny to a subordinate. A joke related to career advancement of a subordinate is never funny. Because to that person who is under your authority, they can never really be entirely sure whether or not you are joking. All of the other researchers in the field, they don't know that Beta didn't actually participate in the research. An equivalent today for me as a professor would be if I came back in after having graded student tests and the student says, oh, how do we do on the test? If I were to respond, well, the grades are pretty low at first, but after my sixth beer, we started to see some A's and B's. So that's a joke that may pop into my head and sounds kind of funny because I know I would never actually do that. And so that might be a funny joke for me to tell some of my professor friends since they know that I would never actually do that. To a student, they can't know for sure whether or not I was actually drunk while I was grading their papers. Joking about a student's grades is never funny to the student. And so those students may be thinking, 
did I get a D because I actually only earned a D? Or did I get a D just because Dr. Bernard had already threw back six Smirnoff Ices and wasn't thinking straight? And also, why do my students think I drink Smirnoff Ice? I drink Budweiser in an aluminum bottle or Yingling. You can see the same thing happen in an office environment. Suppose an employee has been trying to get promoted or a raise for a while. And if you as a boss see them maybe walk into work one day eating a donut, and you make an offhanded joke like, oh, well, maybe if you'd bring in donuts for everyone every once in a while, you'd actually get that promotion you were looking for, right? Even if the boss knows that bringing in donuts has nothing to do with promotion, and the employee thinks that it's a joke, it was said in a joking manner, a lot of jokes are actually based in truth, so that employee can never really know whether if they actually did start to bring in donuts sometime, would that make them seem like a team player and they can kind of buy their way into a promotion? Right, so you see how this, this isn't actually funny to the employee, it actually leaves them wondering with the questions, like, is, do I actually, should I do that? Like, is that actually real? And to show you the long-lasting permanent effects that these sort of ethical violations by supervisors can cause, Ralph Alpher in the 1980s talked to his son and in fact gave him the advice not to enter science if you would do it for seeking approval and recognition because those are few and far between, and you'll be lucky to get an occasional pat on the back. And that's still probably great advice for today's social media world. If you ever find yourself doing something just for the likes, you should maybe reconsider. But also, I'm a total hypocrite, so if you've been entertained and educated while watching this video, go ahead and hit the thumbs up and give me all of the approval that Ralph Alpher really deserves. In 1999, 51 years after publishing the paper, Ralph Alpher still maintained that his career was held back because he didn't receive the amount of acclaim that he should have for his paper, and that actually Beta and Gamov received most of the recognition. 51 years! Imagine if 51 years from now, one of my students is sitting on their deathbed, surrounded by their children and grandchildren, saying, curse you, Dr. Bernard, if only it hadn't been for all those Smirnoff Ices, I would have made something of my life. And I'm like, dude, first, I don't drink Smirnoff Ice. I don't know where this rumor started. And second, you're surrounded by your kids and your grandkids. You did make something of your life. And that's probably my message to Ralph Alpher as well. George Gamow undoubtedly made a huge ethical violation in adding someone to the paper who did not do any of the work. However, Ralph Alpher's career was not held back by this. He had 300 people, including news media, attend his PhD dissertation. He went on to a long and successful career where he did all kinds of work. But frankly, the 1950s through the 80s were not a time to be a theoretical physicist if you wanted fame and recognition. Right? During this time period, you had the computer, you had the space race, got medical devices. A lot of Alpha's later work went on to talk about the cosmic background radiation. And other researchers who did work on that subject did receive a Nobel Prize for their work. But the difference was, but Alpha was largely a mathematical person. The Nobel Prize went to an experiment, right? The researchers who actually built an experiment and tested and measured the temperature of the background radiation they're the ones who won the prize. And that's been the big shift in recognition has been away from theory and towards practical application experiments and devices. This type of example of a person in authority making a joke that they think is funny might not always be as funny to your students, to your subordinates, to your employees. But maybe the worst part of this whole story is that it's not even that funny. Engineers, on the other hand, way funnier. So if you want to see a funny engineering video, please click on your screen to see one about engineering professors riding in a plane built by engineering students. It's way funnier than this physics video, and it still comes with a positive lesson at the end. 